The show starts in three, two, one. And there goes that man's jacha. <laughs> oh my God, did you see that? <laughs> America's team? Yeah, right. Oh, baby, it's a big day in sports. There's nothing like battling it out with your teammates all season long to go win a championship. Green Bay's got it this year. Huge move for him. I think it's going to be a game changer. We have a lot to talk about this busy week in the sports world. Welcome to the In a League of Their Own podcast. The In a League of Their Own podcast is brought to you exclusively by YouTube. Buy golf kicks. Screw your shoes. Buy Anchor, the easiest way to make a podcast. Buy Canadips. And buy Streamer Loot. Check out the In the League of Their Own merch line today. Welcome to the show. Here are your hosts, Austin and Colin. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 102 of the In the League of Their Own podcast. Kicking us off with today's number 102 sports fact, on the date November 1st, 1902, the University of Minnesota Golden Gophers beat Grinnell University of Iowa Pioneers by a score of 102 to 0. Surprisingly, this is only one of hundreds of lopsided 100-point shutouts in NCAA football history. Um, kind of doing or looking at finding this fact, there were from 1910 to 1929, the total of 139 games were played with 100 points scored by one side. And there's just over 100 that were 100 plus point shutouts. So um, looking at, I, I don't know what game it is, but the last one that happened, it says it's none happened in the 2020s, 2010s. It says one happened in the 2000s, which I don't remember when that, what, teams that would have been but um there's a couple that happened over a couple decades in the past but 1920s had 46 100 plus point shutouts 1910s 93 and the 1900s had 24 and the rest are all in single digits so um a lot of lopsided games early in the 1900s so that's that's insane yeah and kind of yeah just looking at this list like some of these universities you see one that's like well known and then the other one is like doesn't exist anymore yeah like <laughs> 1918 navy versus yersinus university never heard of that nebraska versus haskell nebraska versus kearney state um montana tech pittsburgh and normal like some of these universities it's probably when they didn't have any separations between like a D1, a D2, and a D3, plus like the oh, yeah, it was probably a D1 school playing like a junior college, <laughs> probably. But yeah, I don't know. After oh, what the heck, looking at it, just scrolling through, I found a Wisconsin one Marquette beat UW Oshkosh 103 to zero back in 1917. <laughs> Um, yeah, that's our fact for today. Um, again, before we dive into today's episode, feel free to check out all of our socials down in the description link below. If you hit the more button, it'll show you all of our social links, TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, as well as all of our partnerships with the codes to go get yourself a discount, um, on those websites, uh, Google podcasts, Apple podcasts, Spotify, that's where you can find all of our audio episodes, giving us a five-star rating over there helps us move up the charts. And as always, check out the merch store as well, streamerloot.co, shirts, sweatshirts, mugs, stickers, all that good stuff. You can find that there. So appreciate it. And make sure if you guys are enjoying the content here on YouTube, hit the subscribe button down to the right corner. Um, that helps us get our show out there as well. So let's dive into our NFL stuff for the day. Um, what you got going on in the football league? So... Um pretty pretty interesting um lamar jackson on monday night he got his first pus, uh roughing the passer call since december of 2019 290 straight dropbacks that he has not taken a roughing the passer penalty and he decided to end up giving a shout out to the ref um he's like mr clark i appreciate that i got the call and he said this uh yesterday or wednesday excuse me after practice and 
I it was 620 dropbacks. Excuse me. I wanted to clarify that number. And he just said that it's it's been crazy and how he feels like some quarterbacks in the league had protection and others didn't. And he was just excited that he actually got a call and he wasn't complaining for one. He's just like, the guy hit me in the face. Glad it got called. And hopefully every other quarterback in the league continues to like – have protection and feel safe and whatever. And he's just like, I just want to give a shout out to the guy that did that because this is the first time in a couple of years. Yeah, that's that's weird. I mean, I assume that's a that was the longest stretch for a quarterback to not have a pass interference call. I assume. Um, yeah, you'd think so because that's always been the speculation about him because how much he runs is they don't really call a lot of the stuff that happens even though he is a quarterback and he is a quarterback so like i think he's just wants the nfl to be consistent yeah i mean and plus he's not a pocket passer um usually rolling out for as fast as he is i feel like if he is under pressure he's fast enough to where he gets that space between him and a defender that it makes sense why he's not getting rough in the passer calls because the guys aren't getting close enough to him to get that call <laughs> so um yeah, that's crazy. I didn't realize that because that was Darius Leonard, wasn't it? Yep. That hit him it in the face. Hit him. Yeah. Which it wasn't even like it was just contact to the head. It wasn't even like, oh, he pile drive him into the ground. It was just ball's gone, hand came up, contact to the head on a quarterback. Which again, it's still kind of one of those weird calls. But I mean, once you start calling it, you gotta stay consistent and call it every time. So um yeah, going into a big trade that just happened um, this morning. Eagles trade tight end Zach Ertz to the Cardinals for cornerback Tay Gowen in a fifth-round pick, um, which is kind of crazy given after everything that happened in the offseason. Zach Ertz co- comes out and the organization says they sorted that out. Ertz says he wants to retire as an Eagle, and a couple weeks ahead of the trade de- deadline here, they move him to um, Arizona, so – which, I mean, I guess for Zach Ertz, imagine going to bed after taking an L, being two and four, waking up, and now you're on a five and O team. So I guess in that respect, um, it's good for Ertz. And um, after this trade, too, a stat that came up, interestingly enough, um, the Cardinals haven't had a 100-yard game from a tight end since 1989. And to give some perspective to that, every other team has had at least one since 2013. <laughs> so... Um, Tight end hasn't really been a part of the Cardinals offense for a couple decades, it seems. So, um, yeah, and shout out to the Cardinals for going right away after they lose their tight end to go out and get one right away. Um, they have their foot on it, seems like they have their foot on the gas for going undefeated and not, you know, not having any hiccup. If they, if they are going to have a hiccup this season, this weekend will be the time that it happens. Due to their injuries, Ertz can't play. Chandler Jones out on the defense. The team's a little banged up. Colin Murray dealing with a with a injured shoulder. So if they are gonna go down, this could be the weekend that unfortunately it all lines up and they, they go down. Yeah, and thinking about it too, like you said, obviously he's not gonna play this weekend, but imagine if that's how the NFL was. You just have a game Thursday night and you play the game right away again on Sunday, have two games within a couple of days apart. Uh, obviously, I mean, he's not going to play because he doesn't know the playbook. And I'm sure even if he did, he would want to rest. <laughs> NFL has a rule. You can't play two games within seven days of each other. So you'd be uneligible to play until next Thursday. Like as far when you're beat, when you're traded, like, oh, okay. Cause he just played. So you can only play it's due to like their health and safety protocols that you're only allowed one game, like one game every week. That makes sense. Um, Yeah. Then I guess going into some other injury news here uh, over to the Packers, Kevin King is going to be out Sunday as he's still under um, concussion protocol there. Uh, I guess look for recently acquired cornerback Quentin Dunbar to be activated from the practice squad. They signed him earlier this week, signed him to the practice squad. Maybe we'll look to see him get activated in the next day or two, depending on if he's got the playbook down, if they're that desperate to activate him. Um, 
I guess to at least have them on the sidelines that if somebody gets banged up or needs a breather, they put them in. But um, yeah, Packers secondary. I mean, this week playing against the Bears, they're not going to be playing a team that's, I think that they should be super worried about with the air attack, but nonetheless, they're still banged up back there. Yeah, we kind of got lucky that our top corners are out against a rookie quarterback in a heavier run team. Stokes is going to have to step up to one. Shannon Sullivan <laughs> returned last week, so he'll be the number two. And then it's either going to be Yadam or Rasul Douglas, who played last week, and then Quinton Dunbar. And then also we have rookie Shamar Jean Charles, who played one snap last week as well. Um, all three of those guys, Dunbar has the most experience with 31 starts, Douglas 29, and Yadam 19. But I don't think that's really that big of a problem. I think we're, we lose Malik Taylor too for COVID, the COVID list. So that's unfortunate, but we are getting center Josh Myers back. He's supposed to be back. And Elgin Jenkins is questionable to return this week as well. I know that they're thinking about potentially holding him out until next week when Bakhtiari returns as well to have both of those guys come back at the same time but it's going to be interesting to see what happens this weekend. And yeah, like you said, I think the Packers got lucky that it's the bears on our schedule and we're this banged up um, with the air attack because the bears had the fewest passing yards of the NFL and the second fewest passing attempts. So look for them to run the ball and hopefully we can stop the run and get out of this one with a win. Yeah. Jalen Smith, again, recently acquired from Dallas. Looks like he's going to get some play time this week as well. Um, but yeah, going back to the offensive line, it makes sense. I mean, obviously that Bears defense is good. Their pass attack is going to – Rodgers is going to have to play a game where he's getting rid of the ball in under two, two and a half seconds probably most of the game, uh, kind of like he did against San Francisco. Worked out well for him. A lot of slants, outs, screen uh, passes to receivers – um, got them the W there. Um, but then, yeah, looking forward, Washington, good defense. Cardinals, 5-0. and Seahawks, um, kind of banged up, but still the Seahawks, the defense can step up any given Sunday. So if they can survive, letting those guys get that extra week of rest between Bakhtiari, Jenkins, um, it's good to get Josh Myers back at center. But if they can survive this weekend in Chicago, get the W, and then get those guys back healthy next week, um, that'd be huge. Because, I mean, looking – I mean, uh, history sh- has shown itself. Look at the Colts. Bring back two guys, um, Quentin Nelson, Carson Wentz, two guys dealing with preseason injuries. Oh, they they should be good to go week one. All right, let's throw them in, and then boom, they're dealing with more injuries. So you take that risk of if you bring somebody back too early, other injuries can come up if they're not – conditioned enough and you put them back in too early so yeah and and one other thing as well coming out veteran running back damian williams is on the covid19 list he hits the covid19 list thursday for the chicago bears so if he's unable to provide two two negative tests within 24 hours apart they're going to be turning to khalil herbert rookie or they also have Ryan Nall and Artervis Pierce as other running backs that they have on their practice squad. So since David Montgomery is on the injury reserve with a sprained knee, with William, if Williams is unable to go, that Bears team is in the same position but on the offensive side of the ball. Yeah. And oh, they're still waiting. I think next week Tariq Cohen is supposed to be on pace to be back as well. One of those dynamic guys, runner. Um they use him in the slot, punt, kick returner. He's kind of a uh, Swiss Army knife for the, the Chicago Bears. So I know they're excited to get him back. I think next week was the earliest possibility of getting him back. Um, yeah, I mean, Bears and Packers are both dealing with injuries. It's going to be a matter of wh- whose guys can step up and get the W. It'll be interesting to see, too, rookie quarterback, Justin Fields gets to uh, play in his first um, iconic iconic rivalry game versus the Packers. So we'll see how he stands the test on Sunday as well. Yeah, yes, we will. Um, Carolina Panthers running back Christian McCaffrey will be out Sunday versus the Minnesota Vikings. 
Um, also, Cleveland Browns running back Nick Chubb is ruled out this weekend against the Arizona Cardinals. So those are two huge losses um, for those teams as those running backs have been workhorses for you guys this season. Do you think we're going to continue to see, like I predicted at the beginning of the season, how this year is going to have more transactions, people hurt, whatever, than ever before? It kind of seems like we're on pace for that. Do you think this is pace of people hitting the COVID list, getting hurt, think this pace continues all season? Yeah, and I mean, going off of that again, we've seen a lot of injuries. Um, Russell Wilson, Carson Wentz, Tua Tagovailoa, um, I mean, Jimmy G, all, all starting quarterbacks that dealt with injuries this year. I also think with, I guess, kind of going into another point I have here off of that, NFL trade lines approaching quickly as trade shut down November 2nd at 4 p.m. Eastern time. Um, with the injuries that you mentioned, we might see a craze over the next couple of weeks of trades and people moving around the league because of people getting hurt. Oh, this guy's your second, third string. Hey, we want him. Boom. He's this guy goes here. That guy goes there. Um, I guess some names to throw out there. Um, before the trade deadline, do you think the Texans moved to Sean Watson finally? No, I don't. Um, yeah, it's kind of it's kind of a, of a weird situation again there where they've I been open like the to trade they, talks. I feel like the second they try to, Goodell is going to make him on the exempt list and then nothing's going to be able to go through just because they got to handle his off the field shit before they can continue to do his on the field business. So how could they trade him to a team when he still has court cases and stuff almost every single day? It's like, I don't think that's going to happen. But as far as keeping that spin going on, I mean, it's keeping people talking about the Houston Texans, but I don't think it's any more than that. Yeah. um, Yeah, I agree. I mean, the second you try to move them, because the Texans are holding them. So basically the NFL is like, all right, so let him sort his shit out. He's a third, fourth string quarterback, whatever, he's not going to play. Um, if a team decides to go and get him, obviously they have intentions to play him. So then that's where, like you said, the NFL would step in, put him on the exempt list, and then that's where something would finally happen. Um, two other names to throw out here and that we kind of talked about early in the season if this scenario happened. 49ers Jimmy G has been dealing with injury. Post-trade deadline, he has a hit of, 26, 28 million, whatever it was, if they decide to keep him, if he can't stay healthy, do the 49ers move him? No, because Trey Lance can't stay healthy either. He's um, hurt. Yeah. He hurt oh. his knee. He sprained his knee. Oh yeah, that's right. That's right. Forgot about that. So I don't I don't think they're in any position to move Jimmy G. And I mean, they're still in it in the NFC West. I don't see why they would fucking tank their season away. Because if 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 they do that and they decide to move to Trey Lance, like, yeah, the kid has some promise. It looks like he can be a decent quarterback, but he definitely needs to learn and have the experience of sitting behind a quarterback that knows what he's doing. It seems like he... Like for the, He's played one one game of football since he's turned 20 years old, and that was... This last weekend, it's like he hasn't played football in over two years because of COVID and all that stuff. It's like, that's a long fucking time from not being able to do anything. Like, look at Richard Sherman. Sorry to, like, switch topics, but it's like he pulled his hammy. He's probably done for the year against the Eagles last night. And why do you think that is? It's hard to stay in shape and keep up doing what you're doing when you're away from a team facility or you don't have. And it was, I'm honestly surprised it didn't happen a week ago when their corners just went down, he wasn't even doing nothing. And they're just like, okay, you're going to play. It's like going from doing nothing to in a game, running with those guys. Going to get fucking hurt. Yeah. And then the last name to throw out there for the trade deadline is Cleveland Browns receiver, Odell Beckham Jr. Um, Been very displeased with the team since he's been there last week in their loss to um, the Chargers. Only had three targets, two catches. And looking at some of his stats since he's come to the Browns in 2019, um, after averaging close to 100 yards a game throughout his career, 
last three years, 64.7 yards a game, 45.6 in last year, 41.3. Obviously some injuries to sprinkle within there, but again, a lot of that due to him not getting the targets and looks that he wants. Um, if he's unhappy with the situation in Cleveland, do they maybe move him? Otherwise he is on his last year of contract. So they could wait to move in until next year free agency as well. I think that's what they're going to do. Um, there's no way that they're going to they're going to dish that kind of a playmaker over to a team that potentially they're going to have to face to get to the Super Bowl. So I don't see them doing that. I think they're literally just going to, you know, unfortunately, I feel like he's just kind of going to get wasted this season, um, kind of like he has ever since he's gone to Cleveland. Jarvis mm-hmm. being the number one target there. Their mean run game. He hasn't gotten the touches that he ever has. And I, there's four early speculations on where he could potentially be traded. Tampa hits the list. Jacksonville, Raiders, and the Dolphins are the four teams whose names have made a jump as far as they would go out and get a guy. But all those teams besides Tampa aren't winning teams. Mm-hmm. So... I don't know. It's going to be very, you know, it's going to be very interesting to see what happens with that whole situation. Because if, if it were me, I don't see getting any return this season for OBJ, especially he hasn't even proven that he's gotten back to being healthy and putting up the numbers that he did before he took all of that time off with his ACL recovery. So who knows how good he is or if he's damaged goods, just sitting on the bench, being a decoy. I think they're going to hold on to him and kick him to the free agency and let him try to find a job for himself. Yeah. And, it's, and two, it's again, been interesting with his lack of targets this year, especially get the past couple of weeks, Jarvis Landry has been out. He's been on IR with an injury as well. So the moment he goes out, a lot of people are thinking, Oh, OB, this is OBJ's chance to get again, get back to his normal self, but Baker Mayfield again, not really giving him the targets a run heavy offense. Maybe this week again, OBJ is unhappy, not getting targets. Nick Chubb goes down. Maybe we see OBJ pop off for a 100 yard game this week. Um, I mean, that'd be best case scenario. Obviously, helps the team win, keeps OBJ happy. And yeah, I bet both sides are happy because, like I said, this year he's on pace to have his lowest yards per game at just over 41 yards a game. And the Browns have the best rushing attack in the league, and the Cardinals have the 31st rushing defense. Yeah, Nick Chubb's out, but you still have Kareem Hunt, and I forgot the name of the other guy that they have. They still have two workhorses back there, even yeah. with Chubb out. So, I like I like I say about Baker Mayfield, like, yeah, he's a good quarterback, but he's not an aired-out throwing quarterback where if you have a superstar wide receiver like that, he ain't going to get the touches because they turn it and they hand the ball off and they run for 200 yards a game. So, I mean, there's a lot of season left, so who knows if their game plan is going to change or whatnot and start giving them the ball more. But the way that it's looking right now is his season's being wasted. Because he's yeah. a fucking wide receiver. Yeah, like you said, again, is he damaged goods at this point? Um I mean, that's obviously a big question. The the Brown, Us as fans are like, what the heck are the Browns doing? But obviously they know a lot more about his status than we do, whether it's... Um, well, and then he's had the off-the-field issues of not getting along with people on other teams and lock... Like, who knows if, he, if he's just kind of isolated himself. Obviously him and Jarvis are like best friends. But like, besides that, who knows how the rest of the team truly, really feels about this guy as... No matter what team he's on, just like the whole thing with Cam Newton, how you can't have Cam Newton being a backup on your team because he's going to take all the media's attention and all the – OBJ's kind of got that same aura about him. Like, no matter what team he's on, he's always going to be in the headlines. People are always going to be talking about him. Like, he's one of those people that can't get away from that, and maybe the Cleveland Browns don't like that attention. Yeah, that's a very good point as well. Cleveland seems one of those teams that's always kind of under the radar until these last couple years that they've been like building momentum and they're doing it all quietly. It's really interesting. Yeah. 
And then other receiver news around the league, um, kind of the last injury thing that I have to talk about is that uh, Ravens receiver room loses Sammy Watkins for Sunday, but Rashad Bateman is good to go and will make his NFL debut this weekend in uh, a game against the Chargers. So um, I know Bateman is kind of one of the top receivers coming out of the draft, uh, out of Minnesota, did a lot of great things there. Uh, it'd be great to see what he can finally do as he's been dealing with an injury training camp up till now. So, but obviously it sucks for them to kind of make that trade to where you lose Watkins, but trade him for Bateman where you'd obviously rather have both again in a big game versus, uh, the chargers this weekend. Yeah. And bad news for the Washington football team. Curtis Samuel out and wide receiver Terry McLaurin is questionable this weekend versus the Kansas City Chiefs. Beat the Chiefs while they're down. This is all hope for the Chiefs to maybe squeak one out and turn the tides a little bit. Um, and the last bit of news that I have for injuries is Seattle Seahawks place Russell Wilson on injury reserve. So he will be out the next three games for sure. And running back Chris Carson out this weekend against the Pittsburgh Steelers. Yeah, I mean, again, it's just that carousel of so many injuries going on this year. And you hate to see it, but it really tests the tests the coaching and game plans of these teams. And I guess the only silver lining out of it is it's giving these second, third, fourth string guys a chance to make themselves known, especially going into next year, again, where we're going to see probably some of the highest paid contracts in NFL history bouncing back from COVID, having higher salary caps, all that good stuff. Um, again, that silver lining is that some of these second, third, fourth string guys are going to get paid so long as they're making the best of their time on the field right now. Yeah, it's definitely, like you said, it's a great chance for young players who maybe have not would have had an opportunity if it weren't for these circumstances to make a name for themselves and, who knows, become a huge part of the fan base. Like, look at the guy that the Cardinals trade, like going from an undefeated team to a completely defeated team in the Eagles, that corner. But he's a young guy. Who knows if he can make a name for himself and become a fucking Eagles legend? Mm -hmm. It's like nobody knows at this point. And that's why you play the game. Exactly. Um, yeah, then going into last night's game, uh, kind of recapping that. Uh, Bucks at the Eagles. Bucks come out the gate strong, take a 28-7 lead. Eagles rally late but fall short 28-22. to um, What did you see from last night's game? Only reason the Eagles are even in the game is because defensive pass interference calls on the Bucks. Um, Bucks took their foot, definitely took their foot off the gas after they were up. They just sat back and let the it was such a boring game to watch, honestly. Like, it was very, very, very boring. Um, hence why I only watched a little bit of it and flipped over to the baseball game. So I can't even really tell you a whole bunch about what happened because I only watched the first really half and a little bit of the ending. But, yeah, Tampa definitely took their foot off the gas. As you see, a lot of these teams in the NFL kind of do when you get a lead. Their defense kind of softens up and gives up 450 passing yards but they lose, you know, it's like empty yards, empty calories. These teams know what they're going to do. They're, they're going to win the game. And like we predicted, Tampa wins. Mm -hmm. It's funny too. A lot of sports book users saw heartbreak last night as tickets were broken due to Brady kneeling at the end of the game. Brady's over under was two and a half yards. Uh, that uh, sneak that he went for at the end of the game, put him over that two and a half. His knee, his knees uh, to end the game brought him back under that. So there was a lot, saw a ton of sports <laughs> tickets that were broken because of that, where people had uh, Jalen Hurts gets a touchdown right, uh, Zach Ertz gets a touchdown right, Antonio Brown gets a touch like eight to ten leg parlays all get lost due to Brady kneeing at the end of the game. So, but that's sports. Um, that's all that shit happens. Another thing that's interesting too is. The fact that the Eagles go for too late for no reason to where if they don't get it, then they have to go for a two-point conversion to tie the game over under in the game with seven points. Then they score a touch. But if they yeah. got it and scored again, they automatically won. Yeah. 
but I mean, in the end, it didn't end up working out, but the, the spread was bucks by seven. So again, that's another thing where it's like people who had bucks by seven Eagles go for two for no reason, end up losing the game. Um, it's just funny how that stuff happens. Obviously being in Wisconsin, we don't have a sports book here, but um, I mean, it's so funny to obviously being on the outside, looking in at these situations where people are out thousands of dollars due to one thing that happens, but yeah, Pat McAfee has his, uh, has a super boost that went last night and it's a free bet. Obviously it's free. You get your money back if you don't get it, but they had 40, I think 48,000 people that all tagged on to the super boost and FanDuel would have lost $12 million if it hit. And the only thing that didn't hit was Brady. They had Brady one and a half yards and at the end, he finished with one because he lost a yard and a half by kneeing all the times at the end of the game. And a lot of people are calling into speculation how, as far as gambling goes, kneeing the ball down should just be like a fielder's choice, a sacrifice in baseball where it shouldn't count negatively against your stats. Because goes as running, a zero yard gain. Yep. You're just running the clock out to win the game where it's not, you're not intentionally trying to make a play where you're just taking a knee. So obviously you're hurting your stats, but it's not like you're, you know, you're doing it, you're doing it to win, move a run over. It's, people are saying it should be looked at as like a sacrifice in baseball where it doesn't count. And I, I completely agree. I don't feel why a quarterback taking a knee at the end of the game should reduce their rushing yards. <laughs> yeah. Cause ultimately that doesn't hurt their average. I mean, if you have five runs for 20 yards and then you need the ball, for a negative two yards and three straight plays, that's hurting your personal stats. Again, these like at that point in the game, they don't care. They got the W. They don't care about their personal stats. But again, as people putting money on these games, they're losing. In, in Pat McAfee's uh, Super Boost case, twelve million dollars. Um, but yeah, yeah, it'd be interesting to see if they change that and kind of make it as a sacrifice. But at the same time. If sports books do that, they realize they're going to lose more money. Like they're basically they signing a way to do odds. it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's kind of all I had for headlines, I guess. Going into a one of the games of the week, I guess we could kind of talk about coming up as Chargers at the Ravens. Um, two four and one teams two MVP conversation quarterbacks, um, two defenses who have won and kind of who have won them games and kind of struggled as well. Uh, I was honestly surprised, again, that they didn't flex this game to Sunday night football as the Sunday night game is Seahawks-Steelers, which, again, is two teams struggling. I mean, should still be a good game, but regardless, I feel like this – Chargers Ravens game would be a better game to watch for prime time, but um, yeah, what are you kind of taking away from this game of the week? Herbert at uh, Lamar. I think the Chargers are going to win this game. Uh, the Ravens are two up and down. Chargers are pretty consistent. I just don't think the Ravens have enough pieces at this point to beat a great team like the Chargers at this point. They're, if they would have been the same capacity as when they played the Chiefs without their couple losses that they've suffered since then, I feel like their team is just too banged up and the Chargers are hot right now. I think the Bolts are going to down them. Yeah, I, I agree. I got the Chargers getting the win on the road this week as well for that one. Um, should be a good game regardless. Two high-powered offenses. I feel like this could turn into kind of a repeat of what we saw last week, Chargers-Browns. Both teams in the 40s, uh, Lamar and Herbert ball out. Um, yeah, we'll see what happens. And then kind of our – we didn't do it last week because we um, didn't have a Friday episode, but kind of getting back to our win-lock upset picks for the week, um, who do you have as uh, getting a win this week? Rams over the Giants. 
That's funny. That's actually uh, that's also my same uh, pick uh, for the win. Uh, Locke, who's expected to win, that's one hundred percent going to get a win this week. Green Bay. Green Bay sounds good. My lock, I got the Bills over the Titans Monday Night Football. You're locking that. Yeah, I'm. I'm high on the Bills train. I'm on the Bills train right now. I'm riding it. Um, and then upside of the week. Who do you got? Are the Steelers dogs? Uh, let me check. None of the numbers. Steelers, are, Steelers are at home. I know that. Uh, Steelers are favored by five. By five points. I'm taking the Seahawks. Sounds good. And then I am taking Pats at home. Cowboys are three-point favorites on the road. I think uh, Belichick figures out that Cowboys offense and hands them their second loss on the year. Just because, I mean, Patriots are two and three. They're getting desperate. They fall to two and four. They're already two games back in that division. So really at this point, they're playing for a wild card spot. I mean, I don't know what the stats are, but I don't know very many two and four teams that end up making a playoffs. So Patriots at home, hard to beat. And then kind of wrapping up the NFL here then, going over the Packers. Again, you that's your lock for the week, Packers over uh, Bears. Um, I guess score prediction, I'll throw mine out there first. I got Green Bay winning as well. Um, I think it's going to be a closer game than a lot of people think. I don't even know what the Packers are favored by. Favored by six on the road. Um, 35-21. That's where your score? Yeah. I'm going to say Green Bay wins 24-20. I think it's going to be a one possession game. Um, Green Bay offense, obviously still is, it looks like they're kind of getting back to their old 2019, 2020 ways, but against a really good Chicago defense, I think they hold them under 30 and that Green Bay defense is still hit and miss. I feel like they keep it close. 24, 20. You said 31. 24. Or 35. 35, 24. 35, 21. 21. Sounds good. All right, then. That wraps up our NFL uh, for the week here. Uh, going over to the NBA for a couple things. Uh, uh, real quick on the NFL before we hop over. A uh, new email has came out, has surfaced today from that group of emails that has been released. And one of the people caught in this is the lawyer that represents the whole entire NFL. Um, turns out him and the old owner of the Washington football team and a couple other people had scandals going on. They were giving, taking pictures of people. They were allowing certain perks for certain people. They were completely ignoring some of the laws and re- like rules and regulations. And yeah, I forgot the guy's name. Let me, Jeff Pash is the guy's name, um, which is the top owner or top lawyer of the NFL. And yeah, his name was roped into this as well as ex Washington football team, uh, president Dan Schneider. So Washington football team looks like is the beginning of this whole investigation. And it turns out with the, with the pills and all that too, Washington football team is just the hot spot for all the all the info in the NFL. Yeah, it seems like everything that's been happening lately, their name keeps ending up in the conversation. So, who knows uh, who within that organization is going to get thrown under the bus eventually? NFL VP of Communications Jeff Miller boldly came out yesterday and said. Communication between league office employees and club executives occurs on a daily basis. Jeff Pash is a respected and high character NFL executive. Any effort to portray these emails is inappropriate, is either misleading or patiently false. And that's funny because a day later and the emails are coming out with his name in it. (laughs) So NFL is in some hot water still. Yeah, I feel like it's going to be the story of the league this year. Um, well, I know the Raiders 
as a team, they they want all the emails for all people to come out. All NFL owners, all GMs, all execs, everything to all be open because players now want to know who the fuck they're working for. I mean, it's only fair. It's, it is. It really is. There's 32 is teams in the NFL to be blind to think that the Raiders are the only team that this is happening is childish to think that way. You know, somewhere somebody's done the same things, if not worse. I mean, obviously it's bad what John Gruden did, but a couple of weeks down the road, depending on what comes out, that could be child's play compared to what, what's going to be found in these emails. Um, but yeah, we'll see what happens. Yeah, sad for Derek Carr. I don't know if you saw his quote. He's like, I love the man, but I hate the stick. Yeah. I can't do it. Yeah. Yeah, just that whole team is in disarray right now. It sucks that, again, there's football to be played. They're on a two-game losing streak, and kind of see if they can turn things around this week. But, yeah, then uh, moving into some NBA talk here. Um, an injury. Pelicans will be without Zion Williamson to start the season after rehabbing a foot uh, surgery that he had uh, not too long ago. So, obviously, a Pelicans team that's been irrelevant uh, is going to be without their best player to start the year. Um the last ball brother, Lee Angelo Ball, is set to play for the Charlotte Hornets G League team. So he's kind of making his uh trek into trying to get into the NBA. So we'll kind of see what happens there. And then the last thing I had was that uh Bucks GM John Horst signs an extension to stay in Milwaukee long term. So just got them a chip last year. Obviously, a good signing to keep him. I mean. Drafting Giannis is kind of a dark horse pick years ago. Same thing with Middleton. Um, going out and getting um, Holiday, uh, Lopez. There's been a lot of a lot of moves that this Bucks team has made. A lot of things to again G- GM John Horst. So good to see him staying in Milwaukee. Yeah, and then I just got a couple pieces of news here. Sacramento Kings are exercising third year option on Tyrese Halliburton in order to keep him on the team. Um, he was named to the first NBA All-Rookie First Team last season. He suffered a season-ending knee injury in early May. However, the injury did not require surgery. The team's hoping and expecting him to be back in 100%. And my last bit of news is Kyrie Irving. Um, news still circulating around that whole thing. For those of you, I don't know if people got to see the Instagram live post that he did, and he goes... If you all think that I'm not going to play because of a mandate or a vaccine, y'all are stupid. So clearly he's going to get the fucking vaccine. He's <laughs> he's making a, such a mockery and a foolery of all the media, and I love it because so many people get so butthurt and bent out of shape for everything that he says, and it's just like you know that he's going to be out there playing. Yeah. <laughs> he ain't going to give up a hundred something million dollars because – I got to get a shot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like you said, he's making a mockery of the media to where he's been, he's one of those guys who stays quiet and he only comes out and says something when he needs to. So he lets the meat, like instead of the media taking what he says out of context, context, he says nothing. So the media creates X, Y, Z scenarios as to, Oh, why he isn't getting the shot, this and that, all these different things. Um, yeah, I mean, NBA season starts next week, so obviously by then, if he plans to play uh, game one in Milwaukee, uh, he's going to have to get it done in the next couple of days. But, yeah, it's funny how, like you said, again, he's just kind of making the media look stupid. It's funny. Yeah, then moving into some MLB talk here. Again, postseason in full swing, getting into our championship series here. Last night's Dodgers-Giants game, it kept us on the edge of our seats till the end as LA moves on with a 2-1 win that ended in controversy. Giants Giants first baseman, Bulmer Flores, was at the plate with two outs in the ninth and got rung up on a check swing for the third strike to end the game. After further review, his bat clearly did not break the plane, but when checking with first base ump, he called it a strike, and the play is not reviewable. So, giant season ends in dramatic fashion. Uh, L.A. moves on to try to go back-to-back World Series. 
Um, and then the other side tonight, ALCS kicks off in Houston. Uh, both sides, I mean, obviously Houston's favored in this home field advantage. Uh, on paper, maybe the better team. But I don't know, this Red Sox team has kind of turned a lot of heads. People didn't expect them to get this far going through the wild card, through the Tampa Bay Rays, who were the one seed. Um, and now going on going on to play Houston. So I feel like this is going to be a good series, but we'll see what happens. I think we're going to see both wild card teams facing each other in the World Series. Red Sox and the Dodgers. Yeah, it'd be cool to see. I mean, it doesn't happen often, but at the same time, I feel like it happens more often than other sports. <laughs> Well, yeah, usually the last team in is on such a, a high from having to win games to clinch that spot that we just did it to get here. We're not just going to give up and lose it now. Yeah. Like you see those crazy runs from teams. I go back to the St. Louis Blues when they won the Stanley Cup, how they were literally dead last in the NHL January 2nd, and they rifle off an incredible f- fucking thing that we'll probably never see again in the history of the NHL and end up winning the Stanley cup. Like that's insane. And that's why sports is sports and anything can happen on any given day. And that's why fucking it's awesome. Yeah. In the Dodgers situation, yes, our wildcard team, but also the 106 wins on the year. So they're less of a Cinderella story than the, than the Red Sox are, but nonetheless to have your season come down to one game, a wildcard game to determine the rest, if you move on or go home, uh, to make it past that obviously takes a lot of resilience. And um, it, was kind of, it was cool to see, too, Max Scherzer gets his first uh, professional save of his career. Usually a starter comes in in the ninth inning last night to get three crucial outs to win his team the game. So uh, just goes to show again kind of the just how good that guy is. <laughs> yeah, and questions from the Brewers and Christian Yelich have come up. Um, reports as to I potentially I'm not going to like put this out here but like I'm not going to like make the statement but looks a little sketchy for Yelich to hit however many home runs he's hit in that year and now ever since then he's only hit 21 home runs in the last two seasons Um, I mean last year he was out a lot Yeah, the COVID-shortened season, he hit nine home runs. Or, excuse me, this season he hit nine home runs in 117 games. And last year in the shortened pandemic season, he hit 12 in 58 games. So he's literally on such a downhill turn. Um, It's bringing up – I know people are talking maybe he got the juice that Ryan Braun had for that season and – because people who hit home runs hit home runs every single year. They don't have such a fucking slump like that. And for him to be unbelievable, and now he can't even touch the ball. Like, it, it looks suspicious is all I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah, I guess I never thought about that. I guess just as a fan, a fan of the Brewers, it's like, oh, he's just – the dude got paid and he doesn't give a fuck. He's getting his millions now. Um, that's always what I thought it was is that – you ball out to get your contract and then either people continue to ball out or they're like, they're satisfied. They got their money and they don't care. Um, but yeah. But for him to be that dominant for two straight years <laughs> to go to completely shit. Yeah. Like it doesn't just happen like that. Like you don't, I don't know. Some just doesn't seem right to me, but hopefully Bruce can figure it out. Yeah. Sounds good then. Uh, going over to the NHL again, season's underway. What's the latest over there? Uh, the first suspension of the league has been handed out. Detroit Red Wings' Dylan Larkin receives a one game suspension versus actions during the Tampa Bay Lightning. Um, he's also so- uh, fined $30,500. Um, I don't even really understand why. Like, he just punched. Two guys are yelling at each other and they were skating like off the bench 
and they fuck. He just ended up punching one of the guys in the face, and he ended up going down. And it's just like, come on. But you can't punch a guy in the face who's not expecting it. So dishing out that fine. Um, however, Tampa Bay Lightning overcame three goal deficits two different times in that game to end up winning seven to six in overtime last night. That was such a barn burner. Um, Boston Bruins locked down young defenseman Charlie McAvoy on an eight-year, $76 million extension. And he continued to have some comedy as he was at his press conference. And the reporters go, oh, well, what's going to be your first purchase with now that you signed your big ticket? He goes, oh, I think I'm just going to give my dog a bunch of bones. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, shout out to Charlie for that. And then Ovechkin, that's two goals in his first game back. So he's off to a, a really good pace. Um, Seattle Kraken ended up getting their first victory in franchise history last night, four to three over the National Predators. And yeah, season is fully underway. Um, three games going tonight Hawks, Devils, Canucks, Flyers, and the Wild and the Ducks. So I know what I'm going to be doing later. And other than that, there's really nothing nothing going on. Um, Ottawa Senators ink Brady Kachuk to a seven-year deal, massive ticket on his end. Um, yeah, Buffalo Sabres with all their controversy going on around Jack Eichel. They were out the Montreal Canadiens 5-1 to one without him. Um, I don't know. Columbus Blue Jackets, after losing their goalie this offseason or over the past 4th of July to the fireworks incident, they end up winning eight to two over Arizona. I don't know. A lot of teams. It's it's really cool after the expansion to happen because it's like realizing that some of these teams lost some of their good guys again, and it's a little bit different getting used to. Because in expansion years, that's when everybody cuts bait, trades, fucking gets rid of all their dead cap, and a lot of these teams are basically rebuilt from nothing, and it's going to be a an awesome year of hockey. I think, I think this year is going to be really, really awesome. And then I'll wait because this is my feel good Friday. So. Sounds good. Uh, moving over then uh, kind of last topic here, college football uh, highlighting some games coming up this weekend. Uh, our Wisconsin, Wisconsin Badgers play an unfamiliar uh, team that you don't see very often army. Uh, they play them at Camp Randall Saturday night, seven o'clock. And then uh, not too many big games. Again, it's a bye week for a lot of teams like uh, um, trying to think who. No, Alabama plays this week. I can't remember what, what team has a bye week this week that is in the top, but uh, two games to highlight 11 Kentucky at number one, Georgia. Uh, Kentucky having historically the best. Uh, season in in football history for that uh, that school uh, Georgia the lone uh, unbeaten team or no no there's other unbeaten's but um, yeah with how good that offense is looking we'll see if Kentucky can hang in with them and then TCU at number four Oklahoma again on paper it looks like Oklahoma should have a cakewalk but with their controversy at quarterback. Um, them keeping game, a lot of games close. TCU obviously looking to finally be that team to upset Oklahoma this week. Yeah, I don't think there's going to be – I don't think Oklahoma's going to run that risk anymore of keeping Spencer Rattler in for a full game. So I feel like their close games of potentially getting blown out are done because the mm -hmm. second he struggles, they're going to the freshman, and he's going to fucking light them up at 300 yards. yeah. Yeah, I could, I could see a fumble, an interception, and he sent a struggle early on the first quarter. All right, you're out. Cause they, Even a three and out. Yeah. Because that's a high-powered offense. Yeah. They, again, Big 12 defense doesn't, doesn't exist. So if, they, if they're if they going to stick with these games, again, Oklahoma sits at number four. If they want to stay in that top four, they got to start blowing out teams like unranked TCU, 40, 50, 60 to 0, 7, 14 not giving up any more than that if they want to stay relevant. Um, I guess another, another game to mention, I didn't have written down, but looking at it, number 12, Oklahoma State at number 25, Texas. Texas coming off of their blown lead over Oklahoma in the Red River Showdown. Oklahoma State undefeated, 5-0 and at number 12. 
Uh, they're looking to keep their streak hot as, again, they're eventually going to play Oklahoma last game of the year. So they got to keep things rolling. If they want to try to – I don't know if they don't have a spot in the top four, but if Oklahoma stays in the top four and Oklahoma State stays undefeated and they beat them, uh, it's been a lot – this has been a fun year to watch. I mean, George is the only untouchable team so far. Otherwise, there's been a lot of shuffling around anywhere from two to ten. There's been teams that – Jump from unranked into the top 10, top 10 Iowa, unranked. Iowa looks very, very good. Yeah, they do as well. Uh, they're currently number two, and they have one of the easier Big Ten schedules moving forward, uh, playing teams. As long like, as they don't shit the bed against us. Yeah. Obviously, watching that game, like how many times Wisconsin has been on the other side of that, being high ranked, getting shit on by an unranked team. Hopefully, like, obviously, it'd be great to see Wisconsin do it, but at the same time, go to, Iowa. Yeah, go <laughs> Iowa. We want to get, we want to see a Big Ten team in the top four because Iowa's kind of the last chance. Unless Ohio I want to see State, big, yeah, I want to see a Big Ten team win the championship. Yeah, that isn't named Ohio State. <laughs> well, even if they get back there, but they they ain't gonna because they lost. Yeah, and there's no way that they're gonna put a one loss Ohio State in over a one loss Alabama. No fucking way. No. <laughs> So that's what I mean. So Alabama's automatically that fourth spot if these teams lose. Mm-hmm. And I guess the last game to mention, uh, Alabama, again, coming off their upset to Texas A&M, they fall from one to five. Um, they play at Mississippi State, who is unranked three and two, looks like could be a cakewalk. But Mississippi State, coming off of a win against Texas A&M, who just beat uh, Alabama two weeks ago. So, um, yeah, two yeah two weeks ago, Mississippi beat Texas A&M. Last week, Texas A&M beat Alabama. By that circle of terminology, Mississippi State is better, better than Alabama. Well, and there's, another, <laughs> there's one more team in there, too. I saw ESPN show this graphic the other day. There's four teams that were in this spin cycle of teams beating each other who have beat the other person. And now these teams are playing each other. It's, it's pretty cool. Yeah. Oh. What it was, uh, who was it? Um, oh, L- I think was it LSU because LSU beat Mississippi State, I so they're like Mississippi State beat Texas AM, Texas AM beat Alabama. Alabama, LSU beat Mississippi, so unranked LSU is better than all those teams. <laughs> uh, otherwise, oh, another one, maybe it was, it was this one instead. Memphis beat Mississippi State 31 to 29. I think maybe that's what it was, but there, yeah, there was, I know that there was four teams on that graphic, maybe five actually. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, it's been a fun year of college football rather than your, your top four teams all undefeated cake walking over everybody week two. It's like, all right, this is our top four teams. There's a lot of shit, uh, a lot of moving around. So um, yeah, that's kind of what's going on this week in college football. Then uh, wrapping up our Friday episodes with our Feel Good Friday. Uh, what do you got this week? So my Feel Good Friday story comes out of the NHL this week. Um, Mason, 18-year-old Mason McTavish. Um, in the span of four hours, he went from being a game day scratch to being called um, up to the Ducks game day roster and scoring a goal less than 14 minutes into his NHL debut. Um, the Ducks ended up winning four to one victory over the Winnipeg Jets up in Winnipeg. And another cool part of the story, his parents, there was some delay going through, um, someone with the airport or something. And one of the guys ended up help holding the plane because they knew that their parents were like coming and ended up getting him to the game in time to see their kids score a goal and be there in this first game. And people are giving this kid a lot of praise um, for being only 18 years old to literally less than four hours of being told you're not playing to have to get to the rink, prepare, and then hop on the ice and you're ready to go in your first ever game. Um, head coach says this kid comes in and it's unbelievable the adversity that this kid was able to accomplish like overcome in his first day being so calm and collected and then ending up scoring a goal and getting a win in your first game so shout out miles mctavish 
That's awesome. I was hearing those stories of kind of being against the odds and then for a shot you get, you make the best of it. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, shit. Sorry. There's a, here's another cool one, too, as well. Um, that also was a Anaheim Ducks record. He was the youngest in Anaheim's Ducks history. And then also, same night, Colorado defenseman Bowen Byram becomes the youngest player at 20 years, four months to score his first NHL goal and add an assist. So he did that against the Chicago Blackhawks in the same night. So shout out to those two young kids for setting records for their franchises. That's awesome. Very cool. Yeah, going over to my Feel Good Friday, um, <laughs> I guess to the other spectrum, you're talking about young studs uh, making an impact in history. At age of 98, great-great-grandmother Edith Murray Trina sets a world record every time she competes. Edith is the world's oldest female competitor, power competitive power lifter. Last month, she successfully deadlifted 150 pounds, to put her in the Guinness World Record book. Uh, Edith is a former dance instructor and performer. In her later years, she took a power lifting to keep with her physical fitness way of life. So shout out to Edith, not only being a world record holder, but being an inspiration to people for their, that anything's achie- achievable no matter what age you are. So coming across that earlier this week, I, it was a no brainer to throw this in as a feel good Friday. Um, yeah, it's crazy. Close to 100 years old, power lifter. <laughs> That's impressive. That's very impressive. <clears throat> yeah, uh, that's all I had for this week. Um, again, a lot going on. Playoff baseball, NFL underway, hockey's back, it, basketball back next week. Uh, fun time of year being a sports fan. Yeah, and then my last little uh, tidbit here before we go is news coming across the whole NCAA here. The NCAA task force has just recommended as of today that incoming freshmen in D1 and D2 sports should no longer be required to meet a minimum score on standardized tests for initial eligibility as now as far as they want to adva- advance racial equity and racial equality throughout people, throughout all these universities and whatever and they say it's unfair that some of these kids have to meet certain standardized test scores and stuff when they're coming from a high school that doesn't have half of the money and what they're supposed to you know compared to some of these prep schools and shit like that they're just trying to level the playing field for all athletes and i think that's awesome i don't think that they're just because you could take a test better than somebody else should mean that you, you have a better opportunity than them i think that this is awesome that the NCAA is finally stepping in and uh, they have an eight point plan. It looks like that they're putting forward to advance racial equity throughout all of NCAA sports. So I think this is pretty awesome and we'll see what happens. Yeah, that's awesome to see, especially with all all the controversy that's been going on in NCAA again with the name, Name image likeness coming out over the past couple of months and the NCAA kind of being on the hot seat for really treating student athletes and all that badly for a very long time. Um, it's cool to see that they're trying to make a difference there. Yeah, they're saying these tests are being recognized as forces of institutional racism, which is consistent with their history, as they should be de- jettisoned for that reason alone. Moreover, Basically, the SAT and the ACT, how much is, like, put on, you need to do great, you need to do good, get to college. It's like, they don't want no, they don't want that to fucking matter at all. Because what's one test have anything to do with fucking your life? Yeah. Zero. Man, that's awesome. Yeah, and then I guess we can poke a little bit of fun. JR's uh, Smith's first golfing event. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Getting sworn by bees on the first day and ended up having to go to the medical tent because he's allergic, turns out. Oh, shit. Um, it was funny. His wife actually was swinging a towel around trying to like get him, get him away. <laughs> and it happened on the third hole, dude. The third hole. Get attacked by bees. Yeah, I completely um, forgot about that. Yeah. It was it was pretty funny. They ended up giving him a fifteen minute break, and they let the groups behind him like play through as he had to 
get attention. Swarmed by bees. Yeah, that's funny. Because it turn and it turns out that some of these events, like these college events, some of his his buddies are going to be showing up and like cheering him on. I know Chris Paul says that he wish he could have been there, but he was dealing with something. And it's just like, that'd be so cool. Like be a college golfer and all these pro NBA guys are there watching, cheered them on. It's like, that's cool. Especially for a small school. Was it was in North Carolina A&M that he's at? Yeah. North Carolina A&M. Yeah. And he ended up finishing 81st out of 84. Not last. Yeah, I think I, I saw his scores. It was like he was like plus eight, plus seven. He was plus on all like all of his rounds, but yeah. And w- one thing that I totally forgot to mention also, South Carolina, I think it was sophomore in high school, ended up setting a record. She's a sophomore for their state golf tournament. She shot a fifty-three. Oh wow! Unreal. Right? Is that three? She had three pars. Everything else she birdied the whole day. So 15. What's 15? Yeah, that'd be a 53. Right? Well, a 72 par minus 15 would be a 58. Or 57. Maybe it was a 57. But if she got eagles, if she got eagles instead of birdies too. It was a 57. 57. Oh, was it 57? Yep. She parted three holes and birdied every single other hole. And it was uh-huh. in North, Car- North Carolina, actually, sophomore. She's a chick. And she set all-time record of at this course, even compared to, like, the pros that have golfed at the course. She has the all-time course record. <laughs> That's – wow. To have a bogeyless round. <laughs> and she also – that 57 is also the state record for boys as well. <laughs> So she has an unbelievable shooting at 57. That has got to be one of the greatest days of your life. Yeah. No like kidding. literally, literally. Cause you'll probably never do that again. No, <laughs> that's being flawless. And then some like, like to have a bogey list. Like if you had a bogey list day and had full pars, like 70, a 72 is a damn good day. If you have all pars, no bogeys. On top of that, you birdie 16 out of your 18 holes <laughs> or 15 out of your 18 holes. Yeah. Yeah. I got to catch a little bit of the inter- a little bit of her interview. Sports Center brought her on uh, today. I caught her on my first break. She was talking. She's just like, yeah, just it was just going for me. My shots are just going. <laughs> it's just like, what else do you say? What else yeah. can you say? Like <laughs> that's fucking awesome. But yeah, she's she's the number one. Uh, ranked golfer in the state and that she was a sophomore so she might be on a three-year run for state championships sounds like it i just still can't believe that <laughs> like i was just like if i shot a 57 i'd retire from golf yeah Keep and- a score card put it in a frame and i'd be done never pick <laughs> up the set again But yeah, um, is any el- anything else came out? No, I just I just refreshed it. Doesn't look like anything. It looks like the Astros are going to be without their ace for the ALCS. Oh, yeah, I see that Lance McCullers. McCullers. Yep. But yeah, other than that, thank you everyone for stopping by and uh, watching the episode. A lot to unpack today. Yeah. It was great, you know, we were kind of all over the place a little bit today, but um, as shit continues to heat up and this NFL investigation is now underway, we will keep you guys posted of what's going on over the weekend here, Um, and we'll see you guys all on Monday. Have a great weekend, everyone. Stay safe, and uh, go Pack Go. See you Monday.